Welcome to the Every Nation West Coast podcast. We are so glad that you joined us. Let's get into the word. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Do you feel the love of God in this place? Amen. God loves you. And I pray that if you don't sense that or know that, by the end of this service, you will know that God loves you. So my name is Anton, and I'm an elder in this church, and I just want to introduce you to three things here quickly, my notes, one page, that's good news, right? That's like the gospel, okay, so it promises to be short. And then uh, I have an incredible book here, it's called The Holy Bible, okay, we're going to use that as a text, and then I've invited someone very special to come and help me, a theologian, and uh, he's in heaven, hopefully looking down, a Canadian preacher by the name of A.W. Towser wrote a book, The Knowledge of the Holy. So we're going to be sharing, out of my notes, the Holy Bible and Toza, not necessarily in all that order. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And nothing is hidden, Lord God, from the God with whom we have to do. So thank you, Father, that this day you intimately know us. You love us, God. You're not a judging God. You're not a condemning God. You're a loving God. You deal with our sin, but God, you love us because we're made in your image. And so I thank you, Lord, that this word comes not only to inform, but it comes to transform us. And we, we declare that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So this, this morning, we're going to preach on holiness revealed. We're doing this amazing series on holiness. What a way to start the year. And we started off, um, our first session was really something like holiness defined. It's about God is holy. Now, I can show you a picture of someone that's joyful, right? I can show you a picture of someone that's sad. But how do I show you a picture of someone that's holy? I know there's those things out of the East, you know, holy men. Well, they look pretty miserable to me. So it's very difficult for us. This concept of holiness is something because it transcends It transcends the fallenness of man. It transcends us. It transcends that it is something so foreign and something so separate from who we are as fallen mankind that we need a revelation. We need it to be revealed and and explained to us. And so I want to start off by just going over holiness defined or or that God is holy. And I'm going to read to you two short little uh, excerpts out of Tauzer. Toza, so listen up. Gene, you're listening, Gene. Good. Holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. A lot of words but it it defines the very essence of who God is. He's holy, it's not something he thought up, it's something he is. Because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. So when you think of the love of God, the mercy of God, the wrath of God, the grace of God, all these attributes of God, they're holy. They're part of the whole. They're part of the holiness of God. God is holy with an absolute holiness that knows no degree, and this he cannot impart to his creatures. But there is a relative and contingent holiness that he shares with angels and seraphims in heaven and with redeemed men on earth as their preparation for heaven. This holiness God can and does impart to his children. He shares it with them by imputation and impartation. And because he has made it available to them through the blood of the Lamb, he requires it of them. God requires holiness of us. To Israel first and later to his church, God spoke and said, Be holy, for I am holy. Does that seem like a big command? But think about this. He did not say, Be as holy as I am holy. He said, Be holy as I am holy. And so we're going to delve a little bit into that. Greg is going to share... Uh, um, holiness um, what are you sharing next week Greg (laughs) holiness restored that's it so this is really a foundation you must come next week next week is like the building today is a foundation that we're laying to prepare for that
The challenge is man fell from this lofty place. He was one with God. He connected with God. There was a holiness about Adam and Eve, a wholeness about them in the Garden of Eden, made in God's image, made holy. But they fell. Man is fallen. And we just have to look at the earth today to recognize that's the truth. So let's read one more thing out of Tarsier. here. And it says this, until we have seen ourselves that God sees us, we are not likely to be much disturbed over conditions around us as long as they do not go too far out of hand as to threaten our comfortable way of life. Have you met people before, and maybe it's you and I? I'm, I'm quite a good guy, right? I've, no, I've never murdered anybody. I've never stolen, well, lots, maybe just a little bit. <laughs> so we, we have these degrees of holiness, don't we? And uh, there's people that are just they're terrible and unholy. And then maybe the pastor's quite, he's quite holy. And then the rest of us are sort of, sort of in between, right? But that's simply because we have not seen the way God sees us. And we need a baptism of clear seeing. I pray this morning that as we unfold this word, that we will see what the holiness of God is, that we will see the condition of our hearts. You know, no one can come to repentance unless they recognize they are sinners and they need a savior. So many people, why do they not come to Jesus? They don't think they need him, right? We have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. We are not disappointed that we do not find all truth in our teachers or faithfulness in our politicians or complete honesty in our merchants or full trustworthiness in our friends. That we may continue to exist, we make such laws as are necessary to protect us from our fellow men and then let it go at that. We let it go at that. Isn't that the picture of fallen man? We try. Something in us. God has placed eternity in the hearts of every man and woman. Every one of you that sit here, there's something of eternity. You know that you are more than just something that evolved from the mud. We are made in the image of God. Although we are fallen, although we are broken, although we are cracked, although we are scarred, the remnants of the glory of God still rests upon us as humankind. And holiness is a part of that. And so that gets on to this, this morning. This God that's incredibly, absolutely holy, beyond comparison, beyond our understanding. The fallenness of mankind, the absolute depravity and how we miss it. But guess what? God had a plan. Like the A-team. Got a plan. Hey, Stephen. God had a plan. It's like the A-team. Got a plan. And that's amazing. God had a plan. And he has a plan. And he reveals it in holiness. God has a plan to restore holiness to man. Neither the writer nor the reader of these words is qualified to appreciate the holiness of God. Quite literally, a new channel must be cut through the desert of our minds to allow the sweet water of truth that will heal our great sickness to flow into it. We need the Holy Spirit to give us an understanding, a revelation of what holiness is. There is no ways we can comprehend it. We cannot grasp the true meaning of divine holiness. Best we know infinitely better. We know nothing like divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power. He may admire his wisdom, admire his wisdom, but his holiness he cannot even imagine. So that's our dilemma this morning. We have a dilemma. How do we understand the holiness of God? How do we? If it is so beyond human comprehension, how do we understand it? Is there a picture we can look at? And we're going to look in the book of Leviticus. Go to Leviticus 16. We're going to start off in the Old Testament and the book of Leviticus is so well spelled out in the book of Hebrews. If you did the Bible study of Hebrews last year with us, you're gonna, these things, the, light, the lights are going to just flick on all the time. So please come to Bible study as well. It's part of the way we just get to understand this amazing God we serve. But let's go to Levit Leviticus 16. I'm going to read parts of the whole chapter. And then we're going to unpack it a little bit. Leviticus is an interesting book. If you... Um, so the top of 
uh, chapter 16 says the day of atonement. And we're going to be talking about the day of atonement. But if you go back in your Bibles, I'm looking here. Discharge causing uncleanliness. uh, Cleansing from infectious diseases. Um, Regulations for skin diseases. Purification after birth. So the book of Leviticus, clean and unclean food. The book of Leviticus is speaking exactly about separation. It's, it's the, remember the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old, contest, Old Testament revealed. You understand that? We read things in the Old Testament and we might wonder, this is crazy, this is weird, why did God do that? It seems so surreal. In the New Testament, when Jesus comes, he unpacks it and it's a physical representation of what God does in our lives spiritually. And so the book of Leviticus is a lot about separation, about being set apart. It deals with the Levitical priesthood and that a priesthood is set apart, separate, holy, separated. You need to understand that. But we come to, excuse me, chapter 16. And um, while you get there, I'm going to have a sip of water. If I can get it open. So, Day of Atonement, it gets wedged here in the middle of the book of Leviticus. It has something profound. Just to give an idea, there's about seven or eight feasts that we see throughout the Bible. Four of them are right around um, Jesus, around what we call Easter, but it's unleavened bread, it's Passover, it's the first fruits, it's all about Jesus dying on the cross and his bloodshed. Then we have Pentecost, okay, where the Holy Spirit comes, the giving of the law. And then we move on to the last three. These are in September. It's Feats of Trumpets, um, and, one, and this one is the Day of Atonement. In, 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 in the Hebrew culture, this is the, the highest feast. It's the most significant one. And we'll see why as we unpack it this morning. So the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord. And we'll get into that. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place. Behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark or else he will die. Because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. For the Israelite community is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So I want you to understand, Aaron has to go in with a bull. It's for his sins. He's an imperfect priest. He's a sinner himself. Although he's the high priest of God, he's as sinful as the rest of us. And so he has to take atonement for himself. And then he's told to take two male goats for the, for the people. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he's to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He's to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Once again, this is the type of Christ. We'll get into that. But move with me now to verse 20. When Aaron had finished making atonement, for the, ho- the most uh, high, holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. And he shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert." It's a little bit of a picture of Jesus that died outside the gates of the holy city, Jerusalem. He died on Golgotha. He was outside the holy city. It's a type of him once again. Last two verses are 
29 and 30. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the 10th day of the 7th month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work. Say with me, not do any work. Say that. Not do any work. It's similar, obviously, to the Sabbath, but here is one day where you must deny yourselves, or in other words, you must humble yourselves before God and not do any work, whether native-born or an alien living among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. And then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath day of rest. So let's unpack this a little bit. Once a year, once a year, the high priest, not even just normal priests, once a year the high priest is told to come into the presence of God, into a place called the Holy of Holies. If you remember the tabernacle, it's a representation of something that's in heaven. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews tells us. But there's three parts. There's the outer court, where the, the animals are slaughtered and things happen. Then there's a place called the holy place where there's certain elements where most of the priests minister before God on a daily basis. But the holy place, the most holy place, the holy of holies is the third part. It is separated from the other two parts. It's the most holy place. It represents the presence of God. And in that place, the high priest could only go once a year. Once a year. It's called the Day of Atonement. What does atonement mean? Well, if you look in Strong's, it's a Hebrew word called kapar. Okay, kapar. And it literally means to cover. In fact, in, the implication is to cover with tar or bitumen. Don't know if you've ever seen anything covered with tar. Very effective. You don't get it off. So it's a beautiful picture already that this atonement is something that is going to cover in such a way that you'll, you'll never be able to discover what's underneath anymore. Beautiful picture, beautiful picture. And that's atonement. It speaks about covering, and it also speaks about a restoration. Because once something is covered, maybe Dennis and I have a big fight. We, we normally have once a week anyway, so this is very real. <laughs> but we have a big fight, and then we make up. What do we do? We forgive each other, we cover over, and then we reconcile. And it's covered, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. We forget about it and we move on. And that's the picture here. Aaron, the high priest, represents the Levitical priesthood. And every year, every year, they had a going. Every year, once, once a year, they went in with blood. He went in with blood. Once a year. For his own sins, remember the bull? And then the two goats... The one, the scapegoat, the other one was slaughtered and that blood was taken in. And that blood was for the forgiveness. It's very much like Passover. It's very much the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It's that picture. It's, it's, it's the, a similar picture. Jesus, the Lamb of God, here yeah, he's the goat that's, that's slaughtered and the sins again, forgiveness. Okay? The book of Hebrews opens this up a little bit more. And it says that Jesus comes as a high priest, but not after the order of Aaron. And why is that? Because Jesus was sinless. Jesus was absolutely holy. This is the big difference. Jesus did not need to bring blood for himself. He did not need to. The other thing is Aaron died, and then the next high priest came, and he died, and the next high priest came, and he died. Well, Jesus lives forever, right? And so the amazing picture once again is Jesus comes once for all. Hebrews, you can read it in Hebrews chapter 7 all the way through to 10. Jesus comes once after a different order, an order of Melchizedek. Don't have time to go into that. Come to Bible study. But Jesus comes after a different order because he's holy and he lives forever. And we're going to see that he came once for all. He dealt with this once for all. So we had this it's like repetition, you know, like when you're in sub A, you know, one plus one equals two, right? You come the next day. How much is one plus one? Three. No, one plus one equals two. It's almost as if in the Old Testament, every year, God was trying to show us something. Fallen man is trying to show us something. He's trying to show something. My holiness is so beyond who you are. You can only approach it once a year. And there's only one person that can do it, a high priest. If anybody else went in there, they would have been struck dead. 
And we'll read about um, Aaron's sons, that in fact this is what happened to them. And they didn't even go into the Holy of Holies. So that's the first picture that we get out of this, of the holiness revealed. We see a picture of an incredible separation that is so holy that only once a year someone can come into that presence. Okay? The second thing we need to understand is holiness is like fire. Holiness is like fire. We've been reading about the, the fires in, 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 in uh, Hunklip and, and, and Pringle Bay. And it's incredible how devastating fire is, is it not? Uh, I, I read in the newspaper of the one fireman who was fighting the fire and his house burned down while he was fighting the fire. Lost everything. Fire doesn't discriminate. We're either the worst of sinners or the, the Pope. The fire will burn. And God reveals this. He revealed it, for example, in the burning bush with Moses. Do you remember? Moses turns aside. He goes to the burning bush. What is the first thing? God says, take off your shoes because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. We have it with the mountain, Mount Sinai, when the law is given, when God descends on the mountain. It's so holy that God says, no one can touch that mountain. If an animal touches the mountain, you will stone it to death. Moses said he was so fearful he was trembling. It was, it was incredible. The Israelites said, Moses, you go and talk to God. We don't want to talk to this God. We are, we are scared that if we just see him, we will, we will perish. And they were right. We see it at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends. The Holy Spirit descends as fire. In Hebrews 12, and I want to read that for you. It's a beautiful passage of Scripture where it talks about the fact that we haven't come to Sinai. Maybe we can just read it from verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear the command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I tremble with fear. And then it says, no, we've come to Mount Zion, to a city where people are rejoicing. And yet even in this kingdom, we read in verse 28, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. It's representative of His holiness. What is fire? Have you ever thought about it? What sort of element is fire? Have you ever sat watching maybe at the braai, or maybe you, you're just watching a fire? What is it? What are those flames? What are they actually? Science can hardly explain what it is. It's representative of the holiness of God. It represents the purity. When something is in fire, it is purified. If you want to purify gold, you put it in the furnace. You fire it up and the impurities come out. And that's the same with God. Thirdly, we have this paradox between, or between holiness and sin. There's a gulf between God and man. There's a big difference. Have you ever thought about why seemingly small sins, you know, as if there's like small sins and big sins, why in the Bible seemingly small sins have enormous consequences? I mean, think about it. Adam, just, Adam and Eve just eat a fruit and they are banished from the garden and God judges them and the world has fallen. Just one little bite. Come on. What about Lot's wife? All she does is she just looks around. They're fleeing out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Totally ungodly, unholy cities. God separating them. She just turns back. Turned into a pillar of salt. Why is that? It's a small sin, right? Surely, just glancing. Just checking it out for the last time. What about Moses? Moses, the friend of God. He strikes the rock twice and God says, you're not going to the promised land. 
You'll see it, but you're not going. Moses, what was that? We see Isaiah, they're bringing the ark back to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion. And Isaiah just reaches out to touch the ark because it seems like it's going to fall. And he gets struck down dead. David is terrified. Why? Small sins, right? Small sins. Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, was that lie really so big? Come on. I mean, they were at least giving to the church, right? And yet, you've lied against who? The Holy Spirit. There's something that God is trying to teach. And then the two sons that we didn't quite, well, we read briefly about them, but uh, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, priests, can't go into that now, but they came before God with strange fire, it says, and God judged them. They died in the presence of God. You see, that's what holiness demands. That's what this fire demands. That is how serious holiness is. You see, if we think sin is trivial, we think, sorry, sin is trivial when God's holiness seems trite. We don't think much about the holiness of God. Yeah, he's holy. You know, he's a holy God. He's up there somewhere. If we've got that opinion about God, Well, then, sin is, just, sin is just sin. I mean, there's no serious sins, right? But those little sins we do, surely not. And yet the holiness of God, the fire of God judges it. So this is, we, we need to see God like, I'm going to read you three people that saw God a little bit closer than what we saw God. And look what happens. Look what happens when they come into the presence of a holy God. The first one is Isaiah. Isaiah 6, you can go there if you want to. Isaiah, an amazing prophet. I love the book of Isaiah. Often read it. Beautiful prophecies about Jesus. But if you go to Isaiah 6, and this is a man who walks with God, who hears from God, who incredible, one of the great prophets. And he says here from verse 1, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple, Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Have you ever been in that place? I pray to God we will, all of us, experience that holiness of God. And the only thing that you'll be able to say is, I'm ruined. I've had it. All my righteousness is as as nothing. Everything I've done, I might have gone to church all my life, played my tithes every, every, every month. I might have helped granny across the road. I did it all, Lord. But when you come into that presence of God, you recognize that anything and everything you've done, it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. We are totally reliant on our high priest, on Jesus, to deal with it. Do no work. Do no work. It is Jesus' work to make atonement for holiness. God does not want self-righteousness. He does not want us to be Holier than thou. This is holiness revealed. This is the holiness of God revealed. Go with me to Daniel 10. Daniel chapter 10. Another great, incredible man of God. Verse 7. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. He saw this vision of, of God. Okay, you can read about it there. But for sake of time, he saw it. But the men with me did not even see it. But such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. They didn't even see the glory of God and they were running to hide. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speak and I listened to him. I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. So here's Daniel coming into the presence of a holy God and he's just slain in the spirit and he's just down in his faith. He's got no strength left. 
Everything is sapped out of him. The holiness of God just saps everything out of him. What a picture of holiness. Lord, give us a picture of holiness. The last one is Job. Job 42. We know the story of Job so well. And we know that Job is blameless. I mean, God says it. And yet Job goes through this incredible suffering, this incredible wrestling with God and Lord and how. And yet even he comes to the end of it all and God has spoken to him in Job 42.1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Speaking about the holiness of God. Remember what we said? Every attribute of God is holy. And yet Job recognizes as much as he knows about so much of God, he has no comprehension about the holiness of God, even in his suffering, even though he did not know what happened in heaven between Satan and God and the transaction they had and the testing that he was coming through, that it was of God, even though he didn't know that, he says this, it's too wonderful for me. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you will answer me. My eyes have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Have your eyes seen the Lord of glory? Have your eyes seen the holy God? Have you seen the holy God? You will be changed. It's a song that says, and I'm changed in the presence of a holy God. You cannot be but anything else. Therefore, I despise myself. Look at this. I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Revelation of the holiness of God will result in only one thing. Incredibly deep humility. Incredibly deep humility. There is no place for pride in the presence of a holy God. There is no place. Lord Show us your holiness as never before. Now holiness, as we said, it speaks about being set apart. It speaks about of separation. Okay? So where where have we come this morning? First thing, once a year. Remember that? Once a year. The holiness of God is so different from us that it cannot just be approached at any time. As, As it's revealed, we'll get there about how we can get there almost every, well, we can get there every day. Holiness is a fire. It's consuming. It's a ho- it's, it's, the difference between holiness and sin is so big that we cannot measure it. And holiness is separation. At its core, it's set apart from the common. That's what holiness is. It's set apart from the common. The book of Timothy, in fact, says that if you separate yourself from the things that contaminate and corrupt young man, you will be a vessel set apart to God. Holy. Amazing. That's God's heart. God's heart for us is to reshare his holiness with him. He created us for holiness. We were created to be whole. We were created to be connected to God again. That is God's heart. He loves you. He hates our sin. He hates it because it is the antithesis of his holiness. But he loves you and his desire for us to be set apart. That set apart is a process that we call sanctification. That's what it is. That's what it is. We've spoken about righteousness many times from the pulpit. Our righteousness is in Christ. Our holiness is there too. But righteousness is imputed. It's immediate. I stand before you as righteous as I ever will. I will not be more righteous in heaven one day because my righteousness is based on nothing less than Jesus Christ. So 100%, he did it all. I do no work. I do not try and add to my righteousness. Holiness is the process from righteousness and justification moving on to that fullness. It's a process that you and I will walk in for the rest of our lives. But it's the upward call. It's the upward call. It's what God calls us to. And so we need a revelation of holiness. We need to understand it. I'm giving you the foundation. You need to go home and wrestle with God. You need to go and pray. You need to experience this for yourself. There are some things that no preacher will ever be able to impart to you. There are some things that only you and God will work out in your quiet times with Him. Only that. That's the amazing thing. That's the amazing thing. I can't do it for you. I can't come here and put a blessing on you and I'm the priest and there you go. That's Old Testament. Unfortunately, too many Old Testament things have crept into the church. 
You see, we need a change of appetite. Adam and Eve ate of forbidden fruit and their appetite was corrupted and all they want to now eat is the things of the flesh. Have you found that your flesh is still there? There's still a sinful nature. Jesus dealt with the old man, but he's left us in our body that still has those appetites. And this is the process of holiness. God wants to change your appetite. He doesn't want, want to make you vegan. He doesn't want to make you vegetarian. He wants to make you hungry for righteousness, uh, for holiness, for holiness. Righteousness too, but holiness. That's God's desire, a change of appetite. Not an appetite for that which is forbidden for, because it will destroy us. Any engineer will tell you if something is designed for something and you use it for something else, it will soon be destroyed. Don't try and use your Mercedes Benz to go and drive underwater like a uh, submarine. Guess what? You won't get very far. Lastly, holiness is beautiful. Holiness is beautiful. The psalmist said, let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I want to submit to the band this morning. It's not your job to crank us up in the morning, on Sunday mornings. It's not your job. We come in with an awareness of the beauty of the holiness of God, and it should just be automatic worship. The band is this just there to make it a little bit more exciting with some music. Amen? Amen. And that's what it is about. I want to challenge all of us. Let us get a revelation of the holiness of God and let it transform us. And let, it, let us transform our worship. Amen? Trust that. I trust that. That worship is not something we do on a Sunday morning between 9 and 10. It's a lifestyle 24-7. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Amen. You see, the Bible teaches over and over again we become what we worship. You can see that. In the book of Isaiah, it says there, they have set up idols and they become as vile as the idols they worship. What you worship, you will become like. You can watch young people, if they worship Liverpool, I mean, this great, great team, right? One of the, be the best soccer team, right? But they worship that team, and they got the T-shirt, and they know every single name, and, the, you know, everything, the, the, the score in, 19, 19, in 1954 of that amazing game that Liverpool once won, right? Um, all of that. They worship it, and, and you can see that kid becomes like, you could, he's Liverpool, man, all over him, whatever. People worship. They become like it. You watch it. You worship money. Man, you'd never get enough of it. You'd think, is a billion rent? I mean, Elon Musk, I don't want to judge him here, but is a billion not enough? Why do you want another billion? It's like, never get enough. You worship money, that's what's going to define you. Anything, nothing should replace the worship of God. And what do we worship? We worship a transcendent God that is holy. That's the aspect. That's the core of his being. Holiness manifests in love. It manifests in mercy, in faith, many things. But it's holiness. And that's why David said, David eventually, David, this great man of God, that he had his faults as well. But he said this, one thing I've asked, just one thing, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord. Why? Because that's where the tabernacle was or the temple was or where the presence of God was. Why? He says, I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Now, I want to submit something to you, and I'm going to leave it out there, and you're going to have to come to Christian Music School this year to discover more. David brings the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God that's behind the Holy of Holies, and we read that when it was with the Philistines, it was chaos in the land of Gaza. <laughs> it was chaos. It was just plagues and people dying and their gods were falling over and breaking and so they sent this thing back they sent this this god of holiness back and david brings it back and he doesn't put it into the holy of holies he puts it in the little tent on mount zion and the high priest doesn't go once a year he sets up levites to go into that tent 24 7 and worship before the Holy of Holies, and not one of them dies. I'll leave it there. We'll talk about it later. Think about that. It was a foresight of something. David understood that one day all of us would be a kingdom of priests. We're going to unpack that next, next week and to move on, but all of us are a kingdom of priests, 
And we, through Jesus, come into the Holy of Holies, enter by the blood of the Lamb, every day, 24-7, Hebrews 4, since we have a high priest that has gone before us, let us come with boldness, let us come with confidence before the very throne of God, but I'm going ahead of myself, Greg's going to deal with this next week, you can't miss next week, saying I'm coming to church next week, there we go, holiness is beautiful, so let's land this, once again this picture of the atonement and Maybe the band can just start coming up because we want to end in a song of worship. You can move up here so long, band. So we, we learnt about two goats. So think about, first of all, think about, think about Passover. We, we know that Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? And a beautiful picture there. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Beautiful picture. But there's more. On the day of atonement, God reveals something even more. There's two goats. The one goat also gets killed. The blood also gets taken. It's also there for forgiveness. But there's another goat. And on this one, Aaron lays his hands and he puts the sin of all the people on it and then he sends it out into the wilderness. And it probably gets eaten by a lion or something. But it, if, if you read a bit into this, the people would rejoice. It would be, there goes my sin. Bye. <laughs> There it goes. <laughs> what a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. And that's what God did. God laid the sins of all of us upon Jesus, sent him into the wilderness outside the gate to die. And that's where your sins are. If you have given your heart to Jesus, if you have come to the cross, he has taken your sins. You simply need to re receive it by faith. Remember what we said, do nothing. We do not need to add anything. We simply have to come. And that's the invite that God has for us today. He has dealt. He has covered our sins. He has covered us with, he's covered our sins with bitumen. It is clothed. It is, clo it, is, it is separated. He sees it no longer. And he sent it away. He sent it away into the wilderness. This should be enough to let you shout and swing from the chandeliers in this place. If you are battling with sin, if you are struggling with sin, here is the victory. Here it is. And it's tied up with the holiness of God. I want to read two more scriptures and then we'll close. Tauza, Tauza wants to tell us one more little thing as we thank him. Just take it a bit uh, softer, guys. Um, Soundman, sorry. Just take it a little bit down. Listen to this. We must take refuge from God in God. Above all, we must believe that God sees us perfect in His Son while He disciplines and chastens and purges us that we may partake in His holiness. Go with me to Hebrews 10. Two scriptures as we land this. This is the heart of the Father for you. First of all, Hebrews 10 verse 14 says, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's the heart of your God. In Christ, you're perfect. His righteousness is complete in you. You stand before him forgiven if you've received him. You stand totally righteous before him. And then secondly, you are being made holy. This is the heart of your God. And just on to verse 12. How does he do this? 12 verse 10 our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness this is the heart of your God God wants you to share again in his holiness just close your eyes as we pray as we land this so we see today that God is revealed in his word how we can again partake in that holiness isn't that good news isn't that good news that us, fallen, sinful, erring beings, can partake in the Holy of God? The question I have for you is, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to be holy? The invitation is there. As we open up the altar, I... 
want to first appeal to those that are sitting here this morning. You're a very special bunch of people, very unique. See, the Bible says that Jesus leaves the 99 and he goes in search of the one. And you might be that one. You might be the one that's far from him. You might be the one that maybe you sat here and say, well, these guys might be holy and good luck for them. But, but if they only knew, if they only knew me, if they only knew me, Jesus this morning is leaving the 99 and he's coming to you this morning. This is a special invitation for very special people. It's for those that don't know Jesus. God loves you. God loves you. And he desires that you come to the cross. You receive forgiveness. Your sins get covered. And not only get covered, they get sent away. They get atoned for. And that you can partake in his holiness. As we have preached the word, if that is you, if you know in your heart of hearts today that if you die tonight and you stood before God, you know that things are not right. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God wants to do a special work in your heart this morning. Can I see by a raise of hand, I would love to pray with you. This is your moment to change the destination of where you are going, to change your life to partake in the holiness of God. Is there anybody? I'm looking on the right. I'm looking on the left. This is your moment. We want to give you that moment because God loves sinners. God loves those for whom he died. Anybody here? I don't see hands. So I, that's, that's, I hope that's good news. I hope that's that everybody has received Jesus. So let's move on to the next one. Let's move on to the next one. And that is at the heart of this message this morning. And I, the preacher here is as well. It's not, a, it's not an altar call to come forward. We're going to sing a song of dedication. But I want to challenge you and I this morning and say, do we want to share in this holiness? Do we really want to be serious with God? He invites us. It's not as difficult as you think, but it will cost you everything. It's free, but it'll cost you everything. God will change your lifestyle. He will change the way you think. He will change the way your heart operates. Do you want that? I'm asking you, do you want that? As we delve into this, this is serious stuff. We're not just doing a series for filling up the next eight weeks with something we really are intentional and in saying Lord Lord we cry out like Isaiah we cry out like da Daniel we cry out like Job Lord we are ruined as we glimpse the glory and the majesty and the holiness of a God that is totally set apart so in our hearts because there's a day of atonement. There's a day of atonement where Jesus did it all. And we can partake in that holiness. We understand it's a journey, Lord. But God, we want to be serious about this journey. We don't want to run a fun run, Lord. We want to run a marathon. We want to run an ultra marathon, Lord. We are not here to do a fun run of five kilometers and so kind of boast that we, we kind of holy. Lord, as your heart cries out for us to be holy, we want to run a super marathon. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfect of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And so we endure the cross. So as we sing this last song, I want to encourage you. Let's all stand. I want to encourage you. The sermon is finished, but the Holy Spirit is not. And he will go with you. And I want to challenge you this week to get serious with God. I want to challenge you this week to say, Lord, all of you. I want to challenge you this week to say, Lord, give me a revelation of your holiness that I've never seen. Give us a revelation of your holiness, Lord. Thank you, Ben. We hope you were blessed by that word. For more information, visit our website at everynationwestcoast.org. Hope to see you next time.